signals and what's going to change. And then we'll talk about O2 transport, O2 onloading and offloading into and out of, um, or onto and off of hemoglobin in those systems. Okay. All right. Maybe it will advance. Here we go. Okay. Some people, I think they're wrong, but some people will argue that the cardiovascular system is the most important system for exercise. I think it's a very, very important system that has a dramatic effect on our exercise capacity and how all that stuff works. But a lot of times what it's doing is in direct relation to changes in metabolism and things like that. So it's not sort of a, it's a, it's kind of an effector system in those ways. It supports other physiological systems. Almost all bodily functions depend upon proper function of the cardiovascular system. If a tissue needs oxygen, which is basically all tissue, then it's in some way gonna be dependent upon the cardiovascular system, okay? If a tissue has a chance to change its metabolism, which muscle especially does, and the brain does, it's gonna be dependent upon the cardiovascular system. It plays a huge role in exercise and exercise performance, okay? It is also a primary site, or in some ways, the primary site of dysfunction that occurs with aging and disease, okay? And understanding how exercise alters and changes, or at the very least maintains regular normal function in the cardiovascular system can help us to understand, right, how we can prevent cardiovascular disease. Okay? So it's really, really important there. We see several really, really important, some of which are fast, some of which are a little bit, are a little bit slower, really important changes in the cardiovascular system in response to chronic exercise training, okay? especially aerobic training. With resistance training, it may actually do some bad things. There's with some debate on all of that, okay? But we'll, we'll get to there, right? What does it do from a function standpoint? We're not gonna cover most of those. The big ones for us is it functions to deliver oxygen and nutrients. We use the blood and the cardiovascular system that pushes it around to bring oxygen and glucose and free fatty acids and amino acids, right, to various tissues to the brain, especially the skeletal muscle during and after exercise. We do use it to remove carbon dioxide. We looked at that a little bit. Other waste products, right? Like hydrogen, okay? We transport hormones, we maintain body temperature, we maintain pH, right? We can use the cardiovascular system or the blood at least to buffer hydrogen. That's gonna be really helpful. Our primary response is to increases in body temperature. We're gonna use the plasma in our blood to help us sweat and move blood out to the skin. And then it also has important roles in immune function, okay, which we're not gonna talk about whatsoever. We're gonna break, or at least I'm gonna break the structures in the cardiovascular system into three big kind of primary systems or kind of primary buckets, okay? The heart itself, blood vessels, so, arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, and veins, and then the blood, okay? We're gonna treat the blood as its own sort of tissue, its own organ, okay? So we'll go through, in some ways, we'll go through the structures of each one of these things. We'll talk about how they work. We talk about what each one of them can do, and then we'll come back after all of that and talk about what happens to each one of those as you go from rest to exercise back to rest or what happens to them as you go from rest to exercise, rest again, exercise tomorrow, exercise the next day, how are we gonna get these adaptations and things that are gonna happen, okay? Okay, here's the heart. I promise you guys, I am not Cindy. You're not what? I'm not Cindy Gordon, all you gotta know, okay? All you gotta know for me is the four chambers, and how the blood moves through the four chambers. That's all you gotta know. No valves, okay? I don't care how many how many flaps are on each of the valves. You don't have to know the names of the valves, okay? Nothing like that. Nothing like that. 
All I want you to know is right and left, ventricle, right and left, atria, and how the blood moves, right? From systemic circulation, so from venous circulation, into the right atria, into the right ventricle, off to the lungs, give up CO2, gain O2, back to the left atria, into the left ventricle, and then out the AO. That's it. That's all I need you to know. Okay? And you only have to know that much because there are some adaptations that take place in the ventricle. And we have to understand, okay, well, where does the CO2 go? And where does the oxygen come in? That's all the reason that you got to know those things, okay? Nobody freak out. You have to know what chordae tendon they are. And nobody need the, right, any of the coronary arteries, none of that stuff. All right. It's all I want you to know. Okay? You have to know any other blood vessels, right? Really, I just need to know the A1. I don't really care that you know it's a superior vena cava or anything else that brings it back. That's, I mean, it's important, but it's not for the purposes of what we're doing. Okay? Can you guys do that much for me? Yeah? Grant's not a little shirt, and it's like, eh, I don't know. That's asking a lot. Okay. I understand. Okay. So let's talk about the heart for starters. The heart is a muscle. It is in many ways a muscle that is very much just like skeletal muscle. Okay. It looks like skeletal muscle under a microscope. It is striated like skeletal muscle under the microscope. Okay. But it has a couple of special things about it. It differentiates it from skeletal muscle, okay? Right? It has actinomyosin, it looks striped. The thing that makes it different, this always blows my mind. I've forgotten, I meant to look it up this morning. Probably a controversial thing to talk about, but, okay, we'll ask, we'll just pay someone to, 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 to aim. Do you mind telling us how old are you? 22. Okay. How long has your heart been beating, Amy? 20. Almost probably like 22 and a half years, you know, something like that, right? Okay. Is your heart tired? Okay. I mean, physically, maybe not emotionally in those ways. That's a, we don't need, that's a whole separate conversation, right? Anybody else? Is your heart tired? Can you imagine? If every 0.8 seconds or so you were doing a curl, if you're just doing this all day, every day, and you've been doing it for 22 years, can you imagine that? Can you imagine that we were holding our arms out for five minutes last week and y'all were ready to, you know, ready to give up on it? Okay? This for 22 years. Can you imagine how big your bicep would be? Can you imagine how tired your bicep would be? Your heart's never tired. Why? It has a shit ton of mitochondria. It is basically actin, myosin, and mitochondria. Okay? That is what is in cardiac muscles. 40% of its cytoplasmic volume is mitochondria. For comparison, skeletal muscle is somewhere between like 2 and 5%. Okay, so it's like eight times more <laughs> mitochondria than what we have in skeletal muscle. That's why it can just, it can be over and over and over and over and over again for, in some people, a hundred years. Okay, and it does not fatigue because it's really, really good at aerobic compliance. Okay, that's one of the things that separates cardiac muscle from skeletal muscle. Other structural differences are going to help us from a how we tell cardiac muscle to contract sample. Okay. We have these special things called desmosomes, gap junctions, and those things occur at something called an intercalated disc. Okay. So let me show you guys what this in some ways sort of looks like. Okay. And I apologize for the sort of ancient, I drew this in paint kind of thing out of all of this from like, this thing is probably as old as all of you guys. However, I'm kind of attached to it, okay? What we have here is one cardiac muscle cell, one cardiac muscle fiber. Here we have an adjacent cardiac muscle fiber. 
What you see basically at the intersection here, where it comes together, where one meets the other, that's called an intercalated disk, okay? At the intercalated disk, we have these kind of bluey purple structures here. Those are called desmosomes, all right? Desmosomes are like plants. They're gonna hold, okay? They're gonna hold and span across the bit and intercalate this and hold our two cells together. So when one contracts, it's held really tightly to the next one, okay? Then there are going to be what are in essence pores or holes or windows or doorways, whatever makes sense in your mind, okay, that sit open. Those are called gap junctions. And what the gap junction allows us is we have these two fibers that are held very tightly together. And the gap junction allows for sodium and potassium and calcium to pass directly from one cell into the adjacent cell very, very quickly. Okay. We do not have traditional skeletal muscle like neuromuscular junctions in cardiac muscle. Okay, so we're not going to tell cardiac muscle to contract by acetylcholine. We're not going to have it get close and we have primary and secondary thefts. That's not how cardiac muscle works. It works through what we call a conduction system. We'll get into that in the next couple of slides. That's what this looks like. These are things that are unique to cardiac muscle. Skeletal muscle does not have this. Okay. Y'all with me so far? Okay. Some of y'all look a little sleepy. <laughs> Maybe we need to stand up and exercise and stimulate our cardiovascular system a little bit. Okay. Don't do that. Oh, come on, Fernand. All right. How does heart contract? Okay. Here's my next fun, my next sort of fun thing. I found a um, I found a Twitter account the other day that's just dad jokes. Um, and I was like, this is this is where I need to be. Um, but I always think about I was thinking about when I'm like, is your heart tired? Like that's just a complete bad joke. But I got another one. Okay. I'm not really a joke. So let's do this. Let me pick somebody. Who should be? Grace. Can you make your heart stop beating? No? You sure? I think so. You think so? <laughs> okay. Do you make your heart beat slower? If not, stop. I know. Okay, how might one, one go about stimulating the vagal tone? Breathe, box breathing, breathe slowly. Okay. Not talking from the class, maybe? Yeah. Don't do, Don't do it. Are you a singer, Chris? I sure am not. <laughs> do you want to stand up no, and sing for no. us? Please no. It's my birthday. Please don't. Do we need to sing our happy birthday? <laughs> that might invoke the exact oh, same. <laughs> Chris, you have a watch on? Come on, I'm going watch or anything. No, we don't know what our heart rate's doing. Okay. You think your heart rate's up? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Did you did you want it to go up? No. It just happened. I'm so mean, aren't you? Yeah. Right? By doing those things, okay? You maybe can make it go down. We can definitely make it go up. I can make everybody in here's heart rate go up by doing one thing. I'm going to tell you guys what you're going to do. No, not squats. <laughs> All I'm going to say is we're going to do squats in 10 seconds. Okay. And your heart rates have all gone up. Every one of you, your heart rate has gone up. So actually, mine has gone down. Pardon? Mine's gone down, actually. Okay, well, you're just that <laughs> strange, Bernie, but, ah, no, what's happening? Anyway, okay, how does the heart contract? Have you, do you ever think about making your heart contract? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine how much, you would, how much brain power you'd have to devote to be, 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 then you get up, you start wandering around and doing something else, you're like, oh, God, I've got to think about making my heart contract. Right? It would be crazy. Nobody can function that way. Okay? So the heart initiates a contraction. It is involuntary. It is involuntary. Okay? 
we have some level of control by changing our thought process and our circumstances and those kinds of things, but we don't have very much, okay? Cardiac conduction system is the sort of way that we initiate an action potential in cardiac muscle, okay? So we'll walk through what those two things are going to do. We are going to, and it depends upon input from the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, but you experience what is called auto conduction, okay? You have these spontaneously leaky sodium channels in a structure called the SA node, and it gets the threshold, then it repolarizes, and it starts letting sodium back in slowly, 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 slowly. And then there gets to be enough, and it reaches the threshold, and it fires again, and the whole thing starts over. So there's this spontaneous, automatic, intrinsic contraction for electrical signals that are going to be generated. If we remove all input, okay, we cut all sympathetic and parasympathetic input to the SA node, most of you will have a heart rate of about somewhere between 70 and 75 beats per minute, okay? So if any of you want, I would look at mine. Currently, mine was 80, well, no, it says mine was 86 beats per minute nine minutes ago. So if I'm at 86 beats per minute, right, that is over this. So there is some combination of external input that is making that go. All right. So think of my resting heart rate is. It's not happy. Okay. All right, so that's kind of what's going to happen there. So let's walk through what those structures are and how all of that works. I assume you guys have seen this before too, right? Okay, this here, you just have to memorize, okay? Where understanding the chambers and those kinds of things is important and we kind of got to trace the flow of this one. The individual structures are really, really important. We have, here's your heart, right side over here on the left, Left side over here on the right. It literally took me like years to make my brain think that this was an okay way to do this, right? Here's the SA node, right? In the upper sort of quadrant of the right atria. This is where all heartbeats begin, okay? They all begin here. SA node fires, okay? It is going to then spread using those gap junctions and things spread action potentials across the atria, okay? The right atria, some will cross over into the left atria. It will eventually then reach what's called the AV node, which is in the wall, right, of the atria near the ventricle, boom, right here. The AV node then is going to be connected to what we call the AV bundle or the bundle of his. This is a collection of nerves that run down the septum of the heart, it goes down the septum, gets to the apex down here at the bottom, turns, comes back up, and then it begins to fan out and branch off into these little small nerve fibers called Purkinje fibers. Okay. Now, the importance of this, again, structure imparts function. Okay. We can transmit an action potential faster along nerves than we can along the surface of cardiac muscle. And so when it gets to here, there's going to be some spillover of action potentials towards the ventricles, okay, along the cardiac muscle. But by going down like this and then turning back up, the nerves win the race and we restart action potentials moving from the bottom and it goes up, okay? So this should make sense, right? Where are the lungs in relation to this? Where does the pulmonary artery come out? Right? It's like right over here somewhere, right? That is up from the ventricle. Where's the aorta? Oh, it's way up here, right? Blood goes out, up. So what we want to do is we want to start the contraction from the bottom and squeeze, 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 and it forces the blood upwards. Okay, 
It forces it up and helps us overcome gravity by doing this. Whereas if it started at the top and it squeezed everything down, then it's going to go down. This is going to bounce and try to deflect back up. And you're going to get kind of a canceling out of it. That's why this is so important. Okay. You guys with me on that? I need you to know the structures. I need you to know where they're located. I need you to understand why they are so important. Okay. All right. Now, the SA node has fire. Okay. When the SA node fires, that initiates a contraction. When each chamber of the heart contracts, that is called systole. Okay. That is called systole. All four chambers will experience a contraction during what we call one heartbeat or one cardiac cycle. Okay. It contracts, that systole, then it relaxes, that's called diastole. Okay. During systole, we are forcing blood out of that chamber. During diastole, we are filling blood into that chamber. Okay. The amount of time that each chamber spins in systole and diastole is really important. And it's gonna change as your heart rate changes, okay? And so I'll show you guys an illustration of what's gonna happen with that a little bit later on. At rest, with a normal... At rest, we spend about 60 to 70% of our time in diastole. So filling time in a chamber is longer than the time we spend contracting. Okay. So you can work out the math on all of that, right? If at about 75 beats per minute, it takes about 0.8 seconds between each heartbeat. And if we're spending about 60% of the cardiac cycle in diastole, we're going to spend roughly at resting heart rate levels of about 75. We're going to spend about half a second in diastole and about a third of a second in systole. Okay? That amount of time is going to change as heart rate goes up and goes down. And that's going to actually have some important things on exercise performance. Okay. Now, there's this, I don't know how to describe it, a pattern, I guess. Okay. This delicate balance that has to happen where when the atria are contracting, the ventricles are relaxed. So when the atria are in systole, the ventricles are in diastole, right? Atria contract, they shoot, shoot or squirt the blood into the ventricles, so they've got to be they've got to be relaxed. And then the atria relax, blood starts to come back into them, the ventricles contract, they shoot blood out either to the lungs. Or into circulation. Okay. We have to keep this delicate balance and pattern or that rhythmic pattern of atria, ventricles, atria, ventricles. Because if we don't, blood doesn't move. Okay. When people go into cardiac arrest, sometimes one of the things that happens is that pattern gets off. And you've got the ventricles contracting at the same time as the atria and blood can't move around. That's when we gotta get the shock paddles out. Okay, we gotta reset that natural circuit. Okay. All right. We'll visit back on some of these things during exercise. Okay, here is an EKG. Everybody okay? My have PTSD but EKGs? You guys do EKGs in exercise testing and prescription? Okay. Do you also do pathological EKGs? Someone's like, yes, no, maybe. I used to teach the chronic disease class um, the first couple of years that I was here. And before Regina taught it, the, the woman that taught it, they had to do all of these, they did a bunch of EKG stuff. I'm terrible at them, but I can tell you what, you know, sort of AV block and a bunch of stuff is. What I want you guys to know on an EKG is that an EKG is just an electrical representation of where the action potentials are going across the chambers of the heart. That's all that it is, okay? Where are the action potentials going in the heart? So what you see here, we've got a P wave, we have QRS complex, 
then we have a T wave that represents one cardiac site. The P wave, all we're measuring is the movement of action potentials or depolarization of the atrium. That's the initiation of a cardiac site. Then we get this weird like QRS. Please don't ask me to explain why it looks the way that it does because I don't know. Um, I'm sure there's a very reasonable reason for that. But QRS represents that we've moved across okay, the AV node down the, down the bundle of this into the Purkinje fibers and we're getting action potentials into the ventricles. So the ventricle will contract. Okay. And then the T wave out here represents the period of time when the atria is actually not contracting yet. The ventricle has stopped contracting and we are repolarizing or we're restoring membrane potential in the ventricle. Okay. Now you may be wondering, well, if that flow of the ventricle is being repolarized, where do we see the atria repolarizing? And the answer is we can't. It's happening sort of hidden underneath the QRS complex thing. Okay. So you can imagine if systole is longer, there'll be more spread. This will, this will lengthen out. If systole is shorter, they will get kind of squinched together on top of each other. Okay. And then we can learn things about where the active potential is traveling. Is there a problem somewhere or not? If you have what we call cardiac ischemia, if you have a lack of blood flow in certain places, especially in the ventricles, okay, because you have coronary artery disease or something like that, it seems to affect this segment from where we go from the S before we get to the T. We get what's called S and T segment depression, and it doesn't look like this. It's sort of getting sunk down over here. Very, very hallmark sign of cardiac ischemia, which means you probably need bypass surgery or a stent or you just had a heart attack or something. We use these. I say we. People that know what they're doing, not me, can use these diagnostically, right, during a bout of exercise to tell you about your cardiac function, to tell you about your coronary blood flow, about you have congestive heart failure. This is one of the key actual physiological measures that is non-invasive that lets us understand what is going on in your heart, okay? If you have had a heart attack, this is wild to me. They think you've had a heart attack, you call the ambulance, they get you stabilized, you get to the hospital, the first thing they do is they'll give you morphine, they'll give you nitroglycerin to open up all the vasodilate, all your blood vessels. Then they put electrodes on, they throw your ass on a treadmill and say, go. They want to see if they can make you have a heart attack in some ways, because diagnostically that makes the heart work harder and harder. And it will show then it may induce changes in the EKG, which can help them learn where might there be impaired blood flow, where might there be a problem in the heart. Okay. Normally, when you do these, they put what's called they put twelve leads on. You guys, anybody that's a prescription, y'all done? Have y'all done a twelve lead EKG? Yeah. Okay. All around, all around the heart, here, here, in your back, all twelve. Okay. Super fun. They put all of those different electrodes on because then you can pick any three of them and basically triangulate around each of the atria, each of the ventricles, to, and you're going to get an individual EKG that's going to tell you something specifically more so about is that P wave likely from the right atria or the right ventricle, right? Or the right atria or the left atria? Is this from the, the right ventricle or the left ventricle? Let's just see a bunch of different things. Okay. If you want a well-paying job, learn how to read EKGs. Okay. You can do something called cardiac rehab, where basically you exercise people that have had a heart attack, right? Like 50% of adults in the US have cardiovascular disease. Guess what they're all going to have? Heart attack. Okay. 
standard of care now is insurance will pay for eight, 12, 16 weeks, sometimes more of cardiac rehab post heart attack. Okay. Because if you do that and you exercise train them, then their chances of having a second heart attack and therefore dying and costing the insurance company even more money goes down. So almost every hospital has a cardiac rehab. Okay. These people, you can get a job working in a cardiac rehab unit with an undergraduate degree in exercise themselves. There are master's programs where they will teach you, it's a clinical master's program, where they just teach you how to do all of this. You can be in charge of a cardiac rehab program along with a cardiologist. Make more money than all of us. Okay, not the cardiologist, you should make more than the rest of us. Make more money than the PT makes, and those kinds of things. All right, so these are really important. Very good job. If you like working with older people, you like being around old people, right? They're kind of fun, right? So the old person in the room. Uh, then that's who you mostly see when you do these kinds of things. All right, so that's cardiac rehab. Talk about those things. Okay. Now let's talk about, we did a little bit of this earlier, right? Grace, did you recover? Yeah. Okay. A little bit. Now I'm talking to you again. You're like, ah, it's freaked out all over. Okay. There we go. So we talked about resting heart rate. We have not mentioned, right, that your resting heart rate is very much related to your state of exercise training or lack thereof. Highly trained people, they do a lot of aerobic exercise, resting heart rate is lower, okay? If you are more sedentary, like me, it's gonna be higher. Yeah, it may also be higher if you're more stressed out. Yay, way to go me, right? Anxiety disorder, mm, this is great, okay? But you're gonna see these ranges. It is not uncommon to see highly trained individuals have rest, true rest and heart rates in the low 30s, even down into the high 20s, Michael Phillips, <laughs> okay? Sure, I don't know what it is, was, but I mean, it would not surprise me if it was very, very low. But when he was in his peak, the people studying him said that his resting heart rate was like 33. Okay, sure. That seems very reasonable to me, right? Very, very low. Now, as you begin to exercise, he says, I'm like, should we squat? No. Y'all been all right. So, heart rate increases in direct proportion to exercise intensity. So when I go from resting to walking, it goes up a little bit. If I go from walking to jogging, it goes up even more. If I go to sprinting, up even more, okay? This is why we can use heart rate to estimate oxygen consumption and therefore energy use for exercise intensity, okay? That's why all of your Apple watches and Fitbit watches and everything else we can use heart rate and the heart rate response to exercise to estimate exercise intensity. Okay. Now you guys remember, right? There was a lag. I started exercising. There's this lag in oxygen consumption. It takes a couple of minutes, right? It, energy demand goes right up. O2 consumption sort of lags behind. Anybody know what that was called? Deficit. Okay. Good. Heart rate has a tiny bit of heart rate deficit, but it goes up much, much faster. You guys will reach steady state of heart rates within 10 seconds, okay? It may take VO2 several minutes to get caught up. Heart rate goes up really, really, really fast, okay? Every one of you in here has an age-predicted max heart rate. I think you guys have used this and calculated this before, right? So most of you are somewhere in the neighborhood around 20-ish years of age, give or take a couple of years for most of you, um, probably on the, on the upper side, okay? So most of you guys have a age-predicted max heart rate that is very near about 200 beats per minute, okay? It's about 200 beats per minute. I will be in three weeks-ish, I will be 46 years old. <laughs> I didn't get any uh, yeah. Okay. If y'all's age predicted max heart rate 
It's about 200. Why? What? Uh, it's like 175 ish, somewhere in there. Okay. I have 25 beats per minute less of heart rate that I can raise than just about every other thing. Okay. I would say, now think about your parents, but I'm probably not that far from your parents' age. Think about your grandparents. I don't want to give up on here. Okay. It's an odd response, but okay. You think about your grandparents, you're going to get your butt kicked? If I mentioned their age, yes, my grandmother has explicitly told me. Okay, it's fine. My dad is 75 years old. He's soon to be 76. Okay. No, actually, he is 76. He's soon to be 77. My mom is 75. So, um, I lost track of things now. 75, okay. My mom has an age for the max heart rate of about one, what does that mean? Be like 145. <laughs> Okay, so you guys have like almost 50 or 55 beats per minute more than she does. We wonder why your VO2 max goes down, right? As we get older, why your endurance capacity goes down as you get older, it's because you can't raise your max heart rate as much and you can't make your cardiac output go up as much, which we'll see in a few minutes, okay? All of you then, the big thing here though, right? You have this stable age predicted max heart rate, doesn't change with training very much, okay? And then you have resting heart rate that is gonna be, that's gonna be sort of dependent upon state of training, as well as if I'm gonna make you stand up in class and like tell us about the worst age you've been on or sing a song or I don't know, whatever. Whatever it is, we can make your heart rate go up, okay? Or I can give you, sometimes caffeine does weird things, Caffeine does not always make your heart rate go up, except with your exercise. If you're exercising, you get this very additive effect. In some people at rest, it doesn't actually do anything. My wife, like, <laughs> caffeine, like, chills my wife out. So they give you, you know what Adderall is? We have ADHD. Adderall is stimulant. So we give you a stimulant that actually evens you out. It's very strange. Okay. My wife does not have ADHD, but she just does not respond to caffeine. Very, very weird. There's this range between resting heart rate and max heart rate. So you all have this range that you can increase in in order to try to up your exercise intensities, and we'll talk about that. It's called heart rate reserve um, a little bit later on. Okay? All right. So how do we regulate what your heart rate is? Why is your rest and heart rate going to change? What's going on? So as we know, it originates in the cardiovascular center. This originates in the brain, okay? And what we're gonna get then is this autonomic nervous system input where we're gonna release epinephrine and norepinephrine, right, which we talked about in the hormone thing. They go up during exercise, they go up in proportion to exercise intensity, and that will increase heart rate, okay? So when I, acutely do something and it makes your heart rate go up. When I say like, get up and sing happy birthday, you're releasing epinephrine and norepinephrine immediately. It's a fight or flight response. And it raises heart rate thinking I may have to run away or have to fight something off. Conversely, and Grace mentioned this, Grace, you called it box breathing. I don't know what box breathing is, but you can like, you know, in, hold it, out slowly, in, hold it. We can do, in a, breathing especially does this, okay? We can alter what we call parasympathetic input. We can release acetylcholine onto the SA node. We can turn down epi and norepi, increase acetylcholine, and that will lower heart rate, okay? That will lower heart rate. This is generally why when you go to sleep, your heart rate will fall some, is that we're cranking down epi and norepi, and we're gonna increase acetylcholine, okay? So large numbers of sympathetic and parasympathetic neurons innervate the atria, whereas the ventricles receive basically only sympathetic input, okay? We're gonna send stuff to the SA node to alter heart rate, and we're gonna send epi and norepi onto the ventricles, as you guys will see a little bit later on, to make the ventricles contract more forcefully, okay? Which will then raise stroke volume and also further raise 
cardiac output. So at the start of and during low to moderate intensity exercise. So I'm gonna go from rest to walking, okay? I'm not in shape, but this is still pretty low intensity for me. My heart rate increases, but it increases not necessarily because I am releasing epinephrine and norepinephrine. It increases because I'm turning off acetylcholine, okay? So the first thing that we do to raise heart rate is reduce parasympathetic input. We reduce parasympathetic and get ourselves somewhere back to kind of normal intrinsic firing rates, and then we shut parasympathetic off completely, and then we start adding epi and norepi on top of all of that, okay? So it creates a scenario that looks somewhat like this. To look at the bottom panel, we've got rest, we've got 50% of VO2 max exercise, 100% of VO2, and then this is your heart rate, okay? This is your heart rate. So you've got resting heart rate at like 50 beats per minute, okay? And then it's gonna raise up towards 200 as we do things, but that initial increase, so the heart rate is changing by the straight diagonal line is this, okay? The initial change is likely from the withdrawal of acetylcholine. We turn off vagus input, and then once that's completely gone, then we begin to add on epi and norepinephrine. We add on sympathetic stimulation. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. The top panel is just showing where we're coming basically out of the hypothalamus, where those cardiovascular centers are going to be. And you're going to see purple is where the parasympathetic innervation is, right? It is exclusively in the atria. And then the green is going to be the sympathetic innervation, which we'll know will go to the SA and the AV node, but it also goes down onto the ventricles. And so we, we're, that's going to give us both an increase in rate, but also an increase in strength or force of cardiac contraction. Okay. That's how we regulate heart rate. Whatever your heart rate is at any given moment in time is the net effect of sympathetic and parasympathetic input onto the SA net. Okay? It's that at any point. So if you think about something and it stresses you out, sympathetic goes up, or you may withdraw some parasympathetic, right? You start exercising, boom, we dump a bunch of a bunch of uh, epi nor epi in there, and it's gonna go over. Okay. That's heart rate regulation. Okay. Happens very quickly. It's usually very, very, like very accurate, very fast. We do a very nice job of all of this. In some rare occasions, then things don't go. So I'll ask uh, another question. Anybody heard of a medicine called a beta blocker? Do you know what a beta blocker is? Who knows what a beta blocker is? Decrease what we It decreases heart rate. How does it decrease heart rate? It blocks the beta. It blocks a beta receptor. What binds to a beta receptor? Want to guess? Acetylcholine. So if I if I don't let acetylcholine come in, is that going to make my heart rate go up or my heart rate go down? Blocking acetylcholine would make heart rate go up. So which one should it? A beta receptor should bind which of these things? Block sympathetic nervous system. Okay. Beta blockers are very common medications for high blood pressure. Okay. People that take a beta blocker oftentimes are old. Okay. So they already have reduced max heart rates. They come in, you want to exercise them, you're a personal trainer, you're a PT, you're an OT, you're whatever it is, they're on a beta blocker. And so now when they should have a max heart rate of 150, they now have a max heart rate of 100. Okay, 100. And we wonder why walking basically maxes them out higher if it's not from a functional standpoint. So there are different kinds of medications that will block or enhance the effects of each one of these kinds of things. Okay. 
If I just give you an injection of atropine, which is basically epinephrine, in here, I can make all of this stuff. Okay, so there's very, very kind of kind of deals there. Anybody ever been prescribed? They, they oftentimes will prescribe beta blockers if you have uh, kind of severe like fears of speaking in public and those kinds of things to try to keep your heart rate down, keeps it helps keep anxiety down in those ways, makes you feel a little bit less kind of hyped up. So I had a grad student that was prescribed beta blockers. So when he had to talk in the seminar and talk when he defended his thesis and things, he would take one and it would help him kind of stay a little a little more chill in those ways. Okay. Is that good question? Yeah. Um, is there or can you, I guess, explain the difference between like, I guess, acetylcholine and just doing like a muscular contraction? It's just the location of it. Okay. So they're like, they kind of see the back of it. Mm -hmm. When you have like a muscular contraction here, the, like a more acetylcholine. Mm -hmm. like, more contraction. Sure. It's just, so it's the same molecule. And my assumption, and I don't know this, I've never thought about this before. Um, my assumption is that if acetylcholine is the I mean, it is the parasympathetic neurotransmitter. I wonder what the receptors on the SA and the AV node in those places, if they look just like the receptor that's on, on the sarcolemma, on skeletal muscle. My guess is they're probably pretty close. It's just that in this tissue, when acetylcholine binds, it lowers the firing. It hyperpolarizes the SA node and the AV node. It makes it it makes it take a larger increase in input to be able to, to fire. Whereas on the sarcolemma, it does the exact opposite. So how and why, I know that that seems in some ways it's backwards, but it's the same thing. It just does different stuff in different tissues. Okay. Epinephrine and norepinephrine do the exact same thing. Did you guys learn about alpha receptors and beta receptors, beta two receptors and alpha one receptors in like probably human phys? Right? There are multiple flavors of receptors, all of which bind epinephrine and norepinephrine. And it's the distribution or the density of each of those particular types of receptors in certain tissues that determine what the response to epinephrine and norepinephrine are going to be in that tissue. Because if it binds to a beta 2 receptor in a blood vessel, you get that blood vessel is going to relax and you're going to get vasodilation. If it binds to an alpha receptor, in that on those blood vessels, then they're going to constrict. You get the exact opposite things. It's just some tissues have more of one kind of receptor versus another. And that way you can kind of get the same response or get different responses in different tissues, but you only have to use one signaling molecule. So it's kind of a wild, a wild thing. Okay. All right. Great question. Okay. So now there is, that's the sort of autonomic control. There is some ability to have a little bit of external input that helps us to regulate heart. Okay. There are peripheral receptors in your blood vessels, in your joints, and in your muscle. They are much like we talked about with our afferent input and our um, sensory motor integration. There are chemoreceptors that sense, right, pH. They sense other molecules in the blood. They're all we call mechanoreceptors that are in your joints and your muscles that sense primarily movement and changes in position. Okay. And the stimulation of these things can modify sort of hypothalamic, parasympathetic, and sympathetic outflow to bring about an appropriate change in part of the system and also in our respiratory responses or the pulmonary, the breathing response that we'll talk about probably next week. Okay, and that's what all goes into this. Okay, so if you just move your arm up over your head, you stimulate those mechanoreceptors in the joints, and it makes heart rate go up because you're moving. But it's like, ooh, we're moving, more blood flow, more blood flow, faster heart rate, faster heart rate. Okay, so we can do some things that are going to be that are going to be there. All right, that's other ways. That is extrinsic regulation, heart rate. So that's how the heart beats or contracts. The thing that we're going to talk about now is when it contracts, how much blood is going to leave the ventricles when that happens. Okay. 
we're going to talk about a concept or a variable called stroke volume. Stroke volume is the amount of blood that leaves the ventricle every time it contracts. Okay. You can measure it in milliliters most often, or you can measure it in liters. I mean, it's an amount, an amount. I date myself with this reference. I should have brought one, but I can't find one anymore. Anybody ever used a camera that takes actual 35 millimeter film? Like real film? Of course you have. You've never known a world, although Brittany has, okay. You've never known a world where your phone wasn't a wasn't a better camera than the like three thousand dollar camera that my dad had during the eighties. Had this giant zoom lens. Okay. It used to be. You guys are aware that there is this stuff called film, right? Yeah. You put it in the camera and you take a picture. And then you got like a Polaroid. No, it's not. A, it's like a Polaroid, but this is not a Polaroid. Okay, it's in a little roll. Okay. And you can take multiple pictures, but the problem is, is if you expose the film to light, then when you try to develop it, it's ruined. And so one of the ways to prevent that, they would sell camera film, and it came in these little bottles. They were a black bottle, it was plastic, and it had a gray top on it. It was about yay big and about that big around. You may be wondering, this seems like an odd reference, Dr. Black, and you're right. Those little bottles, would hold approximately about 80 milliliters of water or fluid. And so you can, when I started doing this, right, before I even had a cell phone, I know the dark ages of 19, you know, of like 2003, you um, often had me tell the story one time when I was in high school, um, my, my friend, uh, his parents were quite wealthy and they were the first people that we knew that had a cell phone, it was like in a bag. It was like in a bag and they'll sit in their car like a briefcase with a phone. So it was, it was really wild. Anyway, um, about 80 milliliters in an average size person. Okay. About 80 you know, milliliters. So, you know, it's, I don't know, we can look up how many milliliters are in the shop. Probably, you know, that might be something that would be a little more appropriate. Not, you all have seen a shot glass. I mean, we're afraid that. I'm very careful. I'm not suggesting anybody knows anything about taking shots. Right. Okay. No underage drinking, no drinking and driving, we're all good, okay? Very good, <laughs> all right? So, we calculate, we arrive at the amount of stroke volume. We arrive at that 80 or so milliliters through this calculation, okay? At the end of ventricular diastole. So at the end of the time when the atria are pushing blood into the ventricles, there's a certain amount of blood sitting in the ventricle right before it begins to contract. That is called end diastolic volume. Okay? End diastolic volume. You have taken your Stanley cup or whatever it is that you prefer and you've gone to the water fountain, right? And you've put it under there and you're filling it up. And right at the very, very end, when right before it's going to contract, you pull it out, it's got a certain amount of that's in diastolic volume. We filled the ventricle up. Okay. Then the ventricle begins to contract. So it goes from diastole to systole. Okay. Think of that in our cup reference of I'm going to turn the cup off and I'm going to start pouring water or whatever out of my sanding cup. Okay. It, the ventricle contracts, it squeezes a certain amount of blood out. Then at some point after like that 0.3 seconds, it stops contracting. So you turn your cup back up. And most of the time, especially at rest, there's still some fluid or water in your cup, or there's some blood left in the left ventricle. That's called in systolic volume. So how much is in there before it begins contracting? How much is in there at the end of contraction? And you subtract these two from each other, and we can calculate from that how much blood was ejected from the heart, okay, or from the left ventricle, okay, and that is stroke volume. That is stroke volume. Okay, I can tell you guys, stroke volume goes up during exercise. 
And the way that we, the reason that we teach it to you in this way, where we talk about diastolic volume and systolic volume, is that when you look at the response during exercise, okay, or I could change your posture, I could do a whole bunch of different things, right? The way that exercise alters the stroke volume is through by changing both of these things. And so we just need to understand that certain things that go on may be able to increase or decrease in diastolic volume, and other things can increase or decrease in systolic volume, and that's how they're going to exert their effect on the short volume. Okay? If you ever go and have what's called an echocardiograph done, they put an ultrasound on your heart, okay? They can use that to measure the size of your left and right ventricle, of your left and right atria. They can directly measure the amount of blood leaving through the aorta, okay? Um, it's a, a very kind of clinically diagnostic, uh, very useful cardiac tool, okay? I have a master's student who finished last year, and I've had completed what they were saying in her PhD, but she went to ultrasound school at the Health Science Center. She came to do echoes. And like, you know, it's like everything else in medicine, there's this huge demand. And like, you can be a travel echo, uh, echo person, travel ultrasound. It's like hospitals will pay for you to come and like, they'll put you up in a house or an Airbnb for like a year. They'll pay for all your travel. They'll pay for you to come and work in certain places and you can kind of go around. Anyway, so at least it's doing that. But one of the things that you can calculate, if you ever get these things done, or you ever see somebody that's had one done, on their readout, it will calculate something called ejection fraction, okay? And I mentioned this not because it's that important during exercise. It's not that important in you guys because it's relatively normal for most of you, but ejection fraction is essentially stroke volume divided by in diastolic volume. So if all of the blood in the, in the left ventricle right before it begins to contract, how much leaves, okay? How much of it leaves during each contraction? In a normal, healthy person at rest, ejection fraction is about two thirds, okay? So you eject about two thirds of the blood that's in your left ventricle every time your heart beats at rest. As you exercise, that number goes up. You eject more and more, a larger percentage of the blood. If you're a person that has high blood pressure, your ejection fraction typically falls. If you're a person that has weakened left ventricular cardiac muscle strength, okay, your ejection fraction falls. If ejection fraction falls enough, you can't pump out enough blood. Okay? And so it's a very good clinical marker, again, of cardiac health. It's especially important if you're hypertensive, so it's lower at rest because it's got to work against that higher blood pressure in the aorta. Blood pressure goes up significantly during exercise as well. And so if you're already hypertensive and having a hard time overcoming um, systolic pressure, then during exercise, it's going to sometimes get worse. So that's what our ejection fraction is. I put that in here, not because we're going to talk about it ever again, but because it's something that you guys may see in your everyday life. Okay, About once a year, um, my mom's nervous system freaks out and she feels dizzy and lightheaded and has numbness on the side of her face and right over here in her arm. It is a very kind of hallmark of having a heart attack sort of symptom. It seems to be brought on when she either reaches up to grab stuff like out of her closet or when she doesn't listen and she goes outside and she tries to start my parents' ancient lawnmower um, on their own. Um, we got her around my wee pop. My dad, she and my dad, they got a riding lawnmower that has like a push button start now um, so the mom doesn't have to do this. Why she also insists on mowing still at 75, bless her. She's a farm girl at heart. She grew up driving a truck in, in South East Kansas. Um, she just thinks this is what you do. We don't pay people to do things. Anyway, she does this. She goes to the hospital. They have to check her out every time because one time it may really be a heart attack, right? She doesn't ever want to go. My dad says, shut up. And they go to, They go to the hospital. And they check her ejection fraction. They put her on the treadmill and they do an EKG every time. So far, she's always been fine. But they, they will send me what these numbers look like. They're like, this look okay. Um, anyway, so that way, maybe you guys can have some sense of this for yourselves.
All right, very, very quickly in our last couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about the combination of heart rate and stroke model, which is a variable called cardiac output. Okay. Cardiac output is abbreviated as Q, which makes no fucking sense, <laughs> right? It can be CO, obviously, because of carbon dioxide, I guess, right? But it is abbreviated as Q, which maybe is Latin or Greek. I, I don't really understand. But that's what it is. I will refer to it sometimes just as Q. That's what I mean, okay? Cardiac output is the product of the number of times your heart beats in a minute multiplied by the stroke volume or the amount of blood that is ejected every time it beats, okay? So you get a unit on cardiac output that looks like oxygen consumption. It's gonna be liters per minute, right? You have milliliters of, milliliters of blood per beat. You have beats per minute. You multiply those things out and you get liters per minute, okay? Cardiac output is likely the best variable to track with oxygen consumption. As exercise intensity goes up and energy use goes up, air energy use goes up, cardiac output increases in a way that is very linear and very much mimics exactly what's going on. If you have a larger cardiac output at max, you will have a larger max VO2, period, end of discussion. Okay, so we'll leave it here, all right? Your cardiac output at rest, most people is about five to six liters per minute of blood circulating around per minute, which is generally, in you guys, the entirety of the blood in your body will go through the heart once per minute. Okay, we'll stop here. We will start, we will start Wednesday with a hormone quiz, and then we'll finish today. Okay. All right. You guys have a good couple of days. We'll see you today.